we are uh, looking at uh, the topic about a faith that works. You might need a faith to work this week. Uh, James has told us in the very first verse that they were scattered. We're, we're going to be scattered after the service today, going all different kinds of directions. But we also might get scattered a little bit in our lives. Well, we might face what he talks about next, that uh, we have a trial of our faith. We get scattered different directions, and, and then this week perhaps uh, there will be something that will rise at work, in the neighborhood, with a neighbor, Something that's going to rise with a child or a parent. Something at school. It could be a bully. I don't know what it'll be, but we're, we, when those things happen, we need a faith that will work. And then there will perhaps be something that arises this week that we'll say afterward, ah, I should have done. Man, I just don't seem to measure up with God. I just, I, I'm always failing him. And, and I'm going to need a faith that will pull me out of the pit from having failed, having not made it, having not been able to, to accomplish that thing for God. We're going to need the, a faith that works. And, and so today I want, I want to talk about that kind of faith that is not just cheap faith. It's not just talk, but it's real. It's genuine in your life kind of faith. Because that's the kind of faith you're going to need this week. That's what we're going to need. There are difference, uh, differences between professing something and actually possessing something. I can profess to be great and not have attained greatness. I could profess to be smart and not really have attained any smartness. I was uh, taking a, a course in Ugaritic. Now, I know that kind of sounds like a disease, right? It's a Canaanite language that's re related to Hebrew. And uh, I was in class, and, and the instructor had written on the board all these Semitic words. And uh, he said, Can anyone here tell which one's a Gentile name and not a Semitic name? Because they're all names. And I'm the dummy in the class. So I raised my hand. And he says, yes, he always called me Mr. Henderson. Yes, Mr. Henderson. And I said, well, it's the fourth one down. And he said, oh, that's good, great. And he, he moves on. The rest of the class, all their hands go up. And say, whoa, whoa, how did he know that? Right? And, and so uh, he said, yes, Mr. Henderson, how did you know that? And I said, well, I'm just looking at all the names. Everyone's got three letters, and that one has four, so that one must have been the Gentile name. <laughs> process of elimination I mean even a fifth grader could have got that and he said he said uh, yeah that's right the class though the whole class thought man I'm brilliant <laughs> I'm not I'm the dumbest guy in this class they all go on to become professors and theologians and and write theological journals my only article got rejected from the theological journal you know because these guys were brainy there's a difference between professing, saying you're something, and actually possessing, right? Yeah, there is, there, there, there is. Listen, uh, I'm pushing it on a button here. Okay, it's, uh, there's a difference between talking and walking. You know how that goes. There's people who say they're Christians, and you look at their life, and you say, oh my goodness, that's not Christian at all, right? We all know that, right? There's a difference between knowing something and, and showing a lot of people know things, but they could never show you how to do it. They know it, but they can't show it. They don't demonstrate it, okay? There's a difference here between saying and doing. Big difference. I say all this because 83% of Americans identify themselves as Christians. This is just done this year, 2016 poll by ABC. 83% of all Americans claim to be Christians. Most of the rest, 13%, have no religion. They're called the nuns. They say none, okay? That leaves just about 4% that adhere to non-Christian religion combined. That's Jews, Muslim, Buddhists. You go, go down the list, all right? 83%. I, I just, if they were truly not just saying it, but doing it, I don't think our country would be in the mess it's in, do you? 
So there's something, you see what I'm saying? There's something more than just saying. Talk is cheap. We've got to do more than just talk about it. This goes back 11 years, 10 years, 10, 11 years when they took the poll. Back then, instead of 83%, it was 84%. we have dropped 1% of the people saying that they're Christian in the last 10 years. But read it. 84% of all Americans consider themselves to be Christian. That uh, proportion has remained unchanged throughout the past decade. So for 20 years, it's dropped like 1%. People think they're Christians. People think they're Christians. One quarter, though, of those who call themselves born-again Christians. Now, that's not all Christian. All the people say they're Christian. That's just a group in there that's born again. One quarter of all of them rely on something other than God's grace as the means of salvation. What's that mean? That means they think that they're working for it. That, that, that means they think that they got baptized and baptism saved them, or they took the communion, or they were good to their neighbor, or something other than calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to save them. All right? See, a lot of people profess to be something, but they don't really possess. They say something, but they don't really, don't really do that something. Are you following me here? James is going to identify three kinds of faith. Three kinds. According to him, there's faith number one, faith number two, faith number three. No, he calls them this. The first one he says is a dead intellectual faith. They got it up here. But it hasn't migrated anywhere else. They know it. They know it. Listen. He says, faith by itself, if it's just up here in their head, they know the facts. All right? If it's all by itself, they just know it up there, it's dead. He says again, faith, that kind of faith, intellectual, we'll, we'll look at this in more detail, that kind of faith is useless. Why? Because Greek text, it's dead. Uh, he says in verse 26, Th that faith is dead. It's dead. So the first category is what I call a dead intellectual faith. What kind of faith is dead? It's that professed, all talk, no show kind of faith. A person says they have it, you know, like that 83, 84%, they say they have it, but you know they don't have it. It's that professed, all talk, no show. James puts it like this. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith? See, he professes it. He's saying it. Uh, he's talking it. He professes to have faith, but he has no deeds, no action, no walk, no, no real doing in his life, nothing to show, no real possession. He says, can such a faith save him? Here's the expected answer. <laughs> no. So those uh, in that 83 and 84%, a lot of them got to be really concerned because even though you say you have faith, not all faith can save you. See what it says? You've got to have a real faith, not a dead faith, not a dead faith. He puts it this, or Jesus puts it like this. And Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Oh, see, they say it. They speak it. They talk it. Lord, Lord. They know the right name. Lord, Lord. He says, not everyone who says that will enter the kingdom of heaven. I should automatically put up for all of us, whoa. I've said Lord, Lord. Is he talking about me? All of a sudden, I've got to start examining my own life. Now it's not about all those people out there. It's about, about me. He said, not all those who say, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of the Father. Did you catch that? Only those who are doers, who does. It's not just an intellectual, I know that you're the Lord, but it's, there's more to it than that. They do the will of my Father who is in heaven. They act on their faith. Let's go a little bit further. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy? Get the picture here of preaching. Didn't I preach in your name? Didn't I drive out demons in your name? Did I not perform miracles in your name? And he'll say to them plainly, I never knew you. Ooh. 
This is about an intimate, knowing kind of faith. You really know the Lord through your faith. It's not something you just talk. He's saying, hey, these people had talk and they, they were doing some things, but they weren't the right things because they didn't have a relationship with the true and living God. He says, away from me, you, you evildoers. And why does he say this? Previously, he had said, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit. Oh, a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. He's saying, listen, you've got to do the right deeds from the right heart, from the right relationship, a real genuine faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, thus by their, their fruits, you'll recognize them. There's got to be some show, some manifestation in the life. If all you have is an intellectual faith and it does nothing, it performs nothing, then your faith is dead. Saving faith works. It acts. It does something. Often I'll ask somebody, hey, what's Jesus done in your life? And you know what they do? They go back 20, 30 years. I remember a time when Jesus, did, wait a minute. He should be doing something in your life now, this last week. What did Jesus do in your life? Well, I got this faith relationship with Jesus. Man, I was in the Word, and man, the words of Jesus just jumped off the, the page to me, and he told me I needed to love my brother as myself. You, know, you see what I'm saying? There should be Jesus. There's, there's something going on, and I'm doing something for Jesus. Jesus concluded this whole passage by saying, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. Then he talks about the foolish man who built his house upon the sand. If you do the will of God, you're going to have a structure that stands. You've got a faith that stands. You've got an eternal structure in the heavenlies. But if you don't do what it says, you can say all the faith you've got in the world, but you're like that foolish man built his house on the sand. When the storm comes, it's smashed. When you have a coming week and you got problems that arise, you're, you're, you're flustered, you're, you're spent because you don't have the faith upon which to lean that gets you through because you're doing it. Dead intellectual faith. James illustrates this for us. He says, hey, suppose a brother or sister without clothes and daily food. Um, you find a brother or sister that's without clothes and daily food. And someone in the church says, I didn't put anybody out there, but somebody in the church says, go, I wish you well, keep warm, uh, and be well fed. Blessings, my brother. Hey, God is good. I don't know, go out there and find it. You see what I'm saying? And he does nothing about the physical needs. He says, now, now what good is that? Well, it's not any good for that man. If I don't act on it, I can say, well, I believe God's going to provide, but if I don't act on it, how does it help that man? There's, it, there's a, absolutely no value. It's empty. Then he says, in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. If I say I believe in Jesus and there's no actions in my life that reflect I believe in Jesus, my faith is is dead. It's dead. A genuine faith works. It works. You see, likewise, to say I believe in Jesus is not enough. Saving faith is much more than lip service. Often I'll talk to somebody and they'll have a wayward child and they'll say, yeah, but you know, back when he was just five years old in Sunday school, he, he prayed and believed in Jesus. Well, he said the words but genuine faith, he's saying here, really acts. It produces. It perseveres. It goes through the difficult times, the hard times. We may falter, but God brings us immediately back. He disciplines us and we're brought back. Faith, genuine faith, is accompanied by action and deeds. Now there's another kind of faith that he talks about here. It's called a de demonic faith, an emotional faith. One's an intellectual, one's an emotional, giddy, feeling kind of faith. And this particular kind of faith, James says, it, 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 James must have been a guy that came from Missouri because he says, someone will say to you, you have faith 
and I have deeds. Show me your faith. That's the, the, the Missouri saying, right? Show me, the show me state. Hey, James is saying, show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You say you have faith, okay, good. But there's nothing to show for it. Listen, I'll show you my faith. My faith is in action. I pray, I read my Bible, I trust God, uh, I, I I love the Lord with all my heart. I worship. I tithe. I'm doing the the basics. Uh, uh, I'm looking out for for the the people who who are less fortunate. I'm reaching out to them. I'll show you my faith. You can say you have, but listen, I'll show you my faith. I really believe. I trust God. I witness to people. I'm verbal about Jesus. He said, I'll show you my faith. Kind of saying, so put up or shut up. (laughs) It's, It's time Do not just say you have it, lip service. It's time to actually do it. James adds, you believe that there is one God? He says, good. That's a good thing you believe in one God because, hey, listen, Moses said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. God is one. That's a good thing. People say to me, I believe in God. I say, great. That's what James is saying. And then he adds this, uh, even the demons believe that and shudder. He's kind of like saying, oh, what's the big whoop? You say you believe in God? So do demons. In fact, this is what, what we found. 68% of people said, this is an older Gallup poll, couldn't find anything more recent. But 68% of people in 2001, uh, when they were polled, they, they believed in the devil. They believed in demons. And 20% said they, they didn't. And 12 said they weren't sure. But 68% is a pretty large group. That might have even grown because there's such a, uh, all these movies and, and all the teens with werewolves and everything. They, they still think that there's a spiritual element out there. So that might have grown. 72% in 2014 said they believed in heaven as a place to find, as a good place where people have lived good lives are going to eternally be rewarded. But at the same time, 58 of the United States adults also believed in hell. A lot more people believe in heaven than they do in hell. A place where people who have led bad lives and died without being sorry are eternally punished. It's very interesting. They, they believe in these. In all, 76% believe that heaven exists while nearly the same proportion said that there is such a thing as hell back in 2003. Numbers have changed a little bit, but... By and large, most people believe in heaven and hell. Most Americans do not expect to experience hell firsthand. Just one half of 1% expect to go to hell upon their death. You know what that is? 99.5% of all people think they're going to heaven. (laughs) All right? Nearly two-thirds of Americans, actually 64%, said they will go to heaven. The others said they're not sure. But 99.5% don't think they're going to hell. Most people think they're going to heaven. I ask a question often when I share my faith with somebody. I'll just say, have you come to the place in your life where you can say that you know for sure if you died right now, if you go to be with God forever in heaven? Almost everyone says yes. And then when I follow that up with a question, suppose you did die and you stood before God and stood right before him. And God said to you, why should I let you into my heaven? I guess a little more pointed. Now they've got to tell me what they're trusting in. I'd say 75% of the people get it wrong. I've kept the Ten Commandments. I'm a good neighbor. My good will outweigh my bad. I've been baptized. I joined the church. (laughs) Very, very small number actually say, I placed my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and his righteousness was imputed to me and I have a standing before God. And he'll say, come in. Because of my son, Jesus' blood has washed away your sins. They don't say things like that. See, people think they have faith. But it's the wrong kind of faith. Demons have faith. That's what he just said. Demons believe. Here's what they believe. They believe in the existence of God. You say there's one God? Good. Even the demons believe that. They believe in there's one God. Okay, He said they believe in Christ's deity. When Jesus was about to cast out the demons, the evil spirits saw him. They fell down before him cried out, You are the Son of God. Even the demons believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He goes on and he says here in this place, they believe in punishment. Listen, he says, 
what is your name? He says to this guy who's got lots of demons in him. He says, Legion, he, he replied, because that many demons had gone into him and they begged him repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. This goes hand in hand with the next one. They believe that Jesus is judge. And, and they said, what do you want me with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? They know who he is. Swear to God that you won't torture me. They don't want to be judged. They know he's the judge. They fear God. They have a belief where they're afraid of God. They're afraid of Jesus. It says, James says, they believe and they shudder. They're emotionally distraught at his presence. And let me ask this. So how, does you, how is your faith any better? How is your faith any better? How is your faith any better? Do, do you fear God? I mean, look at the demons. They believe in the existence of God, the deity of Christ, place of punishment. He's the judge. And that they fear him. They're afraid of him. How does your faith any better? See, these are penetrating questions we have to ask and evaluate our own soul. James is asking us these. Because we know the demons aren't going to be in, with God forever in heaven. Not, not, not much we know. You see, the demonic faith surpasses dead faith. The one is called dead. At least the, there's something here. It's demonic. It's all emotional. They shudder and they're afraid. And they got this feeling about what's going to happen. But it too cannot save it takes more than an intellectual and an emotional faith to save you. It's James' whole point. It takes a dynamic, life-changing faith. A dynamic, life-changing faith. It does take your mind. I don't want to say that it does not. You have to know something. You have to know something. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, first three verses tell us that when Paul preached, he preached the gospel that saves them. That Christ died for our sins and that he was buried and that he rose again from the dead all according to the scripture. I have to believe the scripture. I have to believe that Christ died, he was buried, and he rose again. I have to believe in the resurrection in order to be saved. I, have to, I, I gotta know that stuff. Paul says, though, in uh, Romans chapter 10, that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Some people miss going to heaven, being saved by 12 inches. <laughs> the distance between her head and her heart. They know it here. But it's dead while it's there. It hasn't mixed with their heart. You've got to believe it in your heart. I want to go just a step further too because what it means to believe in your heart is it means that you also, it takes your commitment. You are committed to. It's interesting. There's a time in the Bible when it said Jesus did not believe. Isn't that crazy? It's found in John chapter 2 verse 22. He said he, did, he knew the hearts of every man and he did not believe himself to them. That sounds kind of weird. King James Version puts it this way. He did not commit himself to them because he knew the hearts of men. He did not commit. Modern translation. He did not entrust. He didn't put himself into their care because he knew the hearts of men. He didn't believe in them. It's telling us something really important about faith. Faith involves putting yourself into someone else's trust, committing yourself to them. You know, there's a chair up here, and I could say, I believe in that chair. I believe it exists. I believe it's real. I believe it's strong. I believe it will hold me up. But it is not, is it? It's all in my head. I could make a, a good emotional case for it. Uh, how I've sat on a thousand chairs before. I can know all about it. But until the moment I actually entrust my body to it. Until I finally commit myself completely to it. I've been just talking, not walking. I've been telling you all the knowledge I possess and not possessing the actual thing. I have to commit myself to it. And that's what genuine faith is. The genuine faith he's talking about here is a total, all-in life commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. A faith that works. You see, you act on what you believe as if you do believe it. I say I believe it. I act on it like I believe it. I act on it like I believe it. That's where I'm committing myself to it. I say that I believe God will take care, then I'm going to act like God takes care. 
I, I, I believe that God wants me to control my tongue, so I've got to act like I should be controlling my tongue. Uh, whatever it is, I, I act on it. That's real faith. He said, you foolish men, man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Let me give you two examples. Was Abraham our father considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? He goes on and he says, you see, his faith and his actions were working together. He said he believed in the, that this was the, the promised heir of God, and yet he put him on the altar. In Genesis 22, God told him to sacrifice his son. Now, wait a minute. How does this work? God, you promised that I'd have all these nations come out of the sun, and this is the one, and you want me to kill them. And he says, so he started the process. You know, you know the story. He raised up his hand. He was going to slay his only son, uh, the, it's called the only begotten son, his, the son of the promise of redemption, and he's about to kill him. And Hebrews said that he believed that God would actually raise him up from the dead to fulfill his word. So he could act on what God said, even though he didn't get it. That's faith. I find this, it says his faith was made complete by what he did, because when he was about to do it, God said, stop, stop, stop. Now I know that you really believe. And he provided a ram caught in the thickets, and he sacrificed him instead. Now I know you really believe. I know that this is genuine, because you trust me, you entrust everything, your only son in my care. And then he adds this, and the scripture was fulfilled that said, Abraham believed in God and it was credited to him for righteousness. And he was called God's friend. Now, when did he believe? This took place in Genesis 22. But I want to show you something interesting that James has done. James has quoted not from Genesis 22 that Abraham believed, but from Genesis 15. This is before Isaac is ever born. He is heirless. He has no child. And he's just gotten all this wealth. And, and he's talking with God. And God, he says, God, I, what am I going to do? I don't have an heir to give all my possessions to. Shall I give him to my, my servant Eliezer? And God said, you're not going to give it to him. You're going to have a child. You're just not 100 years old yet to have that child. You've got to believe and trust in me. And Abraham, he God takes Abraham out and says, look at the stars in the sky. See all those stars? That's how numerous your children are going to be, your descendants. And it says, Abraham believed God. And it was counted to him for righteousness. Now you've got to fast forward almost 20 years because uh, Isaac's now a teenager, okay? And he's about to sacrifice him. Guess what? Abraham has the same faith and trust in action, indeed, 20 years later is the day he first believed. That's genuine faith. It's not he loves me, loves me not. No. It's consistent, always there, genuine, showing itself up. You see that a person is justified in what he does, not by what he says alone, by saying, by his faith, oh yeah, I believe. He says, in the same way, Rahab, the prostitute, story very similar, same way. Was not even Rahab, the prostitute, considered righteous for what she did? The spies came into the city of Jericho, spying it out in the second invasion of spies that were recorded in the, in the book of, of Joshua. And she saw them, and she took them into her household. They learned that there were spies in the city. They came looking for them. She hid them. She hid them. She told them, oh, there, they've already left. They've gone a different way. You know, at that night, then she slipped them over the wall. And that was... An act of faith. She was putting her life on the line because she believed that their God, the Jewish God, Yahweh, the true and living God, is who he was, said he was. She believed. It's so much so that in the book of Hebrews commenting on it, it says, by faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Her faith wasn't just say, oh yeah, I believe you guys. Hey, psh- I don't, I'm worried about my life. Hey, here they are. Get rid of these guys. But, but I believe in your God. She committed her whole life to identifying with them. And God said it was an act of faith. The point is, both demonstrated their faith in action. They had a faith that worked. They had a faith that worked. Now, James wraps up this passage saying this. As the body without the spirit, all right? I got the spirit leaving. Did you see the spirit leave? 
All right. I don't know what a spirit looks like, so that, that was my best bet, okay? As the body without the spirit is dead, people say, well, when is a person dead? When the heart stops? Maybe, maybe not. When they stop breathing? Maybe, maybe not. When there's no more brain waves? Maybe, maybe not. You see, why are you saying maybe, maybe not? Well, it's, it's the moment when the spirit leaves, then they're dead. Now, normally that's accompanied with some of those other things happening, but you all know of where they've put the paddles on the person and revived them, okay? Well, they weren't really dead. The spirit was still there, hadn't left yet. But when the spirit leaves, the body is dead. It's dead. James says this. So faith without deeds or works is dead. It's dead. You can say what you want to say, but if you're not doing what he said to do, your faith is not the real faith. Here's the big question. What kind of faith do you have? A dead intellectual faith? I know all about it. A demonic faith? Oh, I shudder at the very thought of it. A dynamic, life-changing faith. I placed my faith in the true and living God however long ago, and I still trust him to this very day. What kind of faith do you have? What kind of faith do you have? You can have a life-changing faith to meet whatever's going to come this next week when you believe with your head, and with your heart, and with your will. You do it. You do what you believe. You do what you believe. You do what you believe. Now is the time to replace a, replace a cheap talk with a genuine walk. And say, Lord, I really believe. Let's pray. The Father in heaven, there perhaps is someone here that right now in their heart they know that, oh, man, I, I've not had the, the dynamic life-changing faith Right now, they need to, in their heart, just say, Lord, I believe in my head who you are. I believe in my heart. But Lord, I'm committing today. I'm going to commit myself to you as my Savior and Lord. Lord, that genuine faith we know is a faith that saves. Total, all-in commitment faith to you. And anyone in their heart who would pray that way to you, we know, Lord, that you will save them. You will change them from the inside out. And they will live out their faith. Actually possess it, not just profess it. Show it, not just talk about it. Lord, there are others here who perhaps they say, you know, I've wandered. I was once on fire for God. My faith was strong and fervent. and It's waned. Lord, today, right now, in my heart, I pray to you and say, Lord... Increase my faith. Help my unbelief. Replace it. Get rid of the doubt so that I'm able to be bold in my witness and my testimony and my faith for Jesus Christ. I want a live, dynamic, living faith, Lord. Grant that to me. Lord, we know as we began this study James said, if you, if, you, if you lack, just ask God, and you'll give. I pray that you'd increase my faith. Embolden us for what you can do, even here at Bethany. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.